Thank you very much. So um, it's a pleasure to be here. But tonight I'm going to... Well, it, I was going to say I'm going to take you somewhere nice and cold, but we could go outside, couldn't we? I'm going to take you to Antarctica. And I'm, but I'm going to take you to Antarctica in two ways. There will be... Sometimes I'm going to take you to Antarctica today, to, particularly at the end of my talk, to show you what's happening today. But initially, I'm going to take you to Antarctica millions of years ago when Antarctica was green. So this is Antarctica today. And you can see this is a very beautiful image. Can we turn the lights down a wee bit more? Thanks. Just to make the white shine up a little bit more. So this is Antarctica today. This is a satellite image. And you can see that most of Antarctica actually is covered by a really thick ice cap. And in parts of this ice cap, it's over four kilometers thick. And the really important thing to know about Antarctica is that actually it has an impact us, on us here. So we don't do res uh, research in Antarctica just to find out what Antarctica is, but how it then impacts upon the global situation. And the really scary thing, if you like, in a way, is, matter of fact, is if all the ice on Antarctica melted, global sea levels would rise by as much as 50 metres. So if you add Greenland to that, which will go before the Antarctic goes, we're talking about 55, 60 metres of sea level rise worth of ice on the world. There's about 70% of the world's fresh water locked up on those ice, ice sheets in Antarctica. And I'll show you at the end of my talk that one of the things that we do in the British Antarctic Survey is to try and understand what's happening to those ice sheets now in the times of global change and warming. But I'm going to take you back millions of years. So in your head, forget about the snow, forget about the ice. We're going back to an Antarctica. Um, I'm going to start off a million years ago when Antarctica wasn't covered with ice and snow. It was covered with forests. And I'm a, I'm a geologist by training, a paleobotanist, so I work on fossil plants and use them to understand what uh, the vegetation was like on Antarctica a million years ago, but particularly to tell us about what the climate was like in the past. And as it says here, it's to look at, if you like, a window into our future warm world. What will Antarctica look like again? What could it look like if the ice sheets melted and we go into the future in a warmer world? But let's go to Antarctica a bit today. It's a truly beautiful awesome place to work. I think the word awesome was made for Antarctica because it really does fill me with awe every time I go there. It is really beautiful. Um, as a geologist, uh, I used to go down every couple of years when I had a research grant and live in a tent camp to work on the rocks in Antarctica. And so this is uh, part of the Antarctic Peninsula the Antarctic Peninsula is the bit that sticks up towards Antarct uh, South America. And there's, you can see a series of islands there trapped amongst this ice and the big tabular icebergs which are bro breaking off the ice shelves. And you can see um, one of our research ships there that was our sort of taxi to the, uh, to the area. And you can see that actually being a geologist in Antarctica is fantastic because where you do have rock exposed, there's not a lot of that nasty stuff that you get in the UK, like grass and soil and buildings and roads to cover up the rocks. It's a fantastic place for a geologist to work because there, there is 100% exposure of rocks. And on a nice day in the summer, so this would be about February, I think, January, February, the summer in Antarctica, it truly is fabulous. But then one thing about Antarctica, it changes. So this could be the next day, and uh, here we are in my tent. So this is a two-person tent, Scott tent, just like Scott used in the past. Um, and if it snows and you're a geologist, there's not much you can do. The rocks are covered up, so you just have to wait, usually two or three days, for it to stop snowing and then the, for the snow to melt again and the rocks to be exposed. So when there's no... Um, when there's nothing to do, what we do is there's two people in here. This is all our sort of medical kit and food and things around outside. So we'd be in there sleeping, mostly sleeping, because you get physically quite exhausted from working long, long days. Because 
when it's sunny uh, in the summer, there's 24 hours of sunlight, so you tend not to stop working. Um, and then we'd be reading books. It's a really good place to read that book. You know that big, thick book that you can only get past chapter one and you never manage to, to finish? Well, you can finish them in a tent in a storm in Antarctica. Um, we play cards, we play dice, we eat a lot, eat a lot of chocolate, and generally pass the time quite happily. But it's a fabulous place to work, and on, in the summer, like I said, it really is a truly awesome place. Now, although it looks like it's um, covered in ice, it's actually less than 1% is actually rock. And you can see you, there are some islands, up, particularly up here on the Antarctic Peninsula. So this is where I've worked most, and those are the rocks of the right age for collecting fossil plants. But there are rocks all around the coastlines. And here you can see a line of, you can see the dark color here. This is the Transantarctic Mountains which are a line of uh, huge mountains that stick above the top of the ice cap. So they form nun attacks, uh, small peaks above the ice cap. And if I took you to Antarctica tomorrow and just sort of plonked you down on Antarctica, on a rocky bit of Antarctica, we would probably find a fossil plant pretty easily, probably a piece of fossil wood because most of the rocks that are formed around here and around here, uh, actually, and probably underneath the ice, uh, were formed at times when Antarctica was a kind of land area and was covered in forest millions of years ago. And those leaves and fossil bits of plant are preserved there, just like this fossil leaf there, are preserved there to tell us what Antarctica was like in the past. So I'll show you some of those fossils and, and how they tell us what life was like in the past, millions of years ago. But first of all, we have to have a lesson in paleogeography. So this is the whole, the whole world. Imagine it in a ball cut around the back and then pulled open. This is the whole of the surface of the Earth spread out here in what we call a paleogeographic map. And this is particularly 100 million years ago. Now, that's a really important date. It's in the, it's the time of the dinosaurs, so it's the time in the middle of what we call the Cretaceous period. The dinosaurs were roaming the Earth. And that's really significant because this was the first time that Antarctica as a continent sat over the South Pole. So at, at times before that, it'd been up, it started up, up here in the Northern Hemisphere and gradually as a plate moved round over the South Pole. And you can see in the Cretaceous, you can recognize most of those continents. You can see South America, Africa. You can see North America here. You can see sort of what we call Eurasia here. The UK is sort of around in here somewhere. Um, you can see um, India. So India was tucked down here. Here's Australia and Antarctica. Now, these continents here in the Southern Hemisphere form were much closer together at in the time and they formed the ancient landmass of Gondwana that some of you may have heard about. And you can see that actually by 100 million years ago, and Gondwana was splitting up. So this is the really early birth of the Atlant South Atlantic. You can see the Central Atlantic had opened, but there was no North Atlantic at that time. You can see that India was part of Gondwana. It was down here 100 million years ago. And India had begun, was beginning its journey to zoom, literally zoom, plate tectonic speaking, across the ocean here and ram into Asia to form the Himalayas. And then um, Australia, you can see, is still attached to uh, Antarctica. And in fact, there was a land bridge all the way across here, although you can't see it here, but there was a land bridge down there. So most of the continents, this is the, uh, the Pacific, uh, but this is the Atlantic, and the Atlantic was growing at that time, so it was stretching apart. And you can see that there's an awful lot of this light blue color here, and that's the um, shallow shelf. So at this time, 100 million years ago, there's no evidence for large ice caps in either the North Pole or the South Pole. And we're... And, and, um, we know that climates were much warmer because there were plants in Antarctica, and so sea level would have been much higher at that time. And this is what the world kind of looks like in a future high sea level world. You get an awful lot of these shallow shelves, 
So if you're a geologist and you go and you find these uh, areas here, which are now mostly either uplifted as rock or drowned, you will see evidence of shallow shelves, coral reefs near the equator, and a lot of shallow shelf, which has been drowned, land drowned by these high sea levels in the Cretaceous. So maybe a mirror of a future world, except slightly different distribution of uh, continents. So the really key thing to take away from this is that Antarctica was over the pole. And often when I talk about plants in Antarctica, many people say, oh, well, that must have been when Antarctica was a continent at the equator and the temperatures are much warmer. And the answer is no, that's, that's not correct. Antarctica was situated over the South Pole at the time I'm going to talk about, and so we had much warmer climates uh, in, on the world at that time, mostly warmed by natural volcanic eruptions and high CO2 levels. So here's a picture of what, uh, what, it, what Antarctica looked like. So this is a particular island, and I've done a lot of work on, called Seymour Island, which is on the tip of the Antarctic Peninsula. It's a really unusual island. It has no ice cap. And you can see, uh, you, actually, there's a camp. There's our camp up here. So this is about 10 miles of uh, uh, sediment. You can see that it looks kind of sandy. And it, and it is. This is a particularly unusual island, an uh, unusual sequence of rocks, because they haven't been buried and are subject to heat and the pressure that a lot of rocks have. So even though these sediments are tens of millions of years old, they're not hard. In fact, we don't... You, I've never used a hammer for years. We use a shovel. And so we dig up most of this, uh, this rock units by shovel and, and collect it for, for looking at um, fossil pollen. Um, and the only hard bits you get to are about half a metre below the surface when you hit permafrost. And then, believe me, there is nothing harder in the world than permafrost. So we, we've got sort of a, a skim on the top of it, which we can collect. And we generally map the rocks across here, or walking across here and mapping the rocks as we go. And there is some variation there. And there is a sort of a time chart across there. Now, these particular rocks that you're looking in here are um, marine rocks. So they're sediments that formed on the seafloor about a million years ago. And so they've got seafloor fossils in, and you can see in my hand here I've got an ammonite, a nice curled shell of a, a fossil which looked a bit like, um, well, it's a bit like a curled up squid. So there would have been sort of big tentacles out of here, and this was sort of uh, uh, like a car tire full of gas bobbing up and down in the ocean, people think. So this was one of the marine fossils there. And then you can see superb preservation of these fossils. So here's, you can see, a normal shell, like a clam. And you can see another ammonite there. So these were really common in this sea near Antarctica. So here we, we're looking at 70 degrees south, roughly, in, a, in a Cretaceous times. And th these ammonites are very important. They give us uh, proper dates, and they tell us a bit about the sea level. Then you can see this, in the middle there, you can see this fabulous coned uh, uh, gastropod, a kind of snail, and a curly one there. And you can see that this, this one here has really nice, shiny shell on it. So when you walk across the Antarctic uh, rocky sequence and the sunlight catches the, the, the shell, they glint like jewels on the surface. So absolutely spectacular. But this is the original shell material from these fossils. And um, when we expose it, it's there still fresh. So what we do is we take little bits of that shell off and um, take it back to the lab. It goes into a mass spectrometer. And then um, we can do some isotopic work on it, which helps us understand what the temperature was when that beast was living in the ocean. And there's all sim similar uh, techniques used on all of these fossils. And basically what we find is that the temperature in the ocean about 100 million years ago was roughly about 10 to 15 degrees. So really warm waters around Antarctica at that time. Um, now, you know, it's about minus one and we're covered in icebergs. But now, uh, at that time, the, the, the climate was very warm. So here's a reconstruction 
of what we think Antarctica looked like in those seas. So I'm going to show you several reconstructions. They're um, uh, painted by a colleague of mine called Robert Nichols, who specialised in painting uh, dinosaurs and old, re old well, reconstructions of old times. So every time we've done some work, we've sat down with um, Robert at the end, and we have tried to take the picture that's in my head and put it onto his oil paintings, which is a really interesting process anyway. So here you can see all the evidence that we find from some of those fossils. So here's, here's a mosasaur, this huge big marine reptile, bigger than a double-decker bus, and it's eating primitive uh, shark here. So we have the, the cartilage backbones of ancient sharks, you can just about see here some of these curled ammonites in the ocean. There are uh, fish. We find fish fossils. Here's a plesiosaur, so we find um, plesiosaur fossils. Here's a shark attacking a dead land dinosaur that sort of drifted out here. We even find the uh, bones of ducks way back in the Cretaceous. And so the seas were pretty fertile. They were, uh, had plenty of life in them and quite warm. And then you can see the land in the background here. So Bob and I decided we, it's very hard to reconstruct the heights of mountains and things like that uh, millions of years ago. It's, it, you have to look at what the rocks tell you for where they came from back off the, uh, off the sort of land, and it's very hard to tell the, the heights of things. So I asked Bob just to draw the um, Andean mountains because this would be part of the Andean mountain change. So if you've been to Torres del Paine National Park in Chile, you won't be surprised that this looks very similar. And then you can see the forests that were growing on the land that we know from the plant evidence. So we've been looking at the fossils of these marine beasts that were living in the ocean. And what I'm going to show you now is the, the fossil, fossilised remains of these plants that grew in the, in, on the land here. So when these trees and uh, plants died, they would have been washed down the rivers, washed out to sea, floated as driftwood, uh, floated leaves and pollen floated in the air and in, 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 the, in the ocean, and then gradually deposited in the mud at the bottom of the ocean where they've been fossilised and then waiting for uh, over millions of years uplift, then to be exposed on Seymour Island and for me to collect. And this is what we find. The fossil plants from here are really quite spectacular. They're really amazingly good. So we find the imprints of leaves. So here's a little leaf. It's about two centimetres long. It's got this very strong, what's called a venation, sort of, uh, folded venation. It tells me that's deciduous, and that's a little leaf of a plant called Nothophagus, or southern beech, which I'll mention an awful lot. It's sort of the fossil of Antarctica. And there you can see this is fossilised logs, fossil wood, and here is fossil pollen. Because our, because our sediments aren't turned to rock, we can get the pollen out beautifully easily, so you just put some of that sediment that we've collected in our shovel, more or less wish it around in a bucket full of water, and then this million year, old, 10, 100 million year old pollen just pops out as if it was just came there yesterday. And you can see there's lots of different types of pollen. These are, you know, less than, a, much less than a millimeter in size, but you can see very distinctive types, very distinctive sculptures on them which we <clears throat> basically we identify and compare either to uh, modern plants that we know have similar pollen or some of other fossils that we've found. So what can we tell from this? So here's the fossil wood. You can see it kind of looks like modern bits of wood that just left over from our food boxes with a rusty nail in. But actually, this is uh, about, these are about a metre long strips. This is actual rock. So... When these tree trunks uh, were died in the forest, then they were floating out into the ocean as driftwood, and then they sank into the mud at the bottom of the ocean. Eventually, over millions of years, they soaked up mineral fluids, like a sponge almost, and, um, and then, again, millions of years, they, the, the crystals have formed and turned it into petrified wood. So you need a hammer to break that up, and you do need a saw a diamond tip saw to cut through the wood. 
But when you do that, you can make uh, sections like this, which is a piece of fossil wood as a microscope slide. And the wood is so well preserved in 99% of the cases that we can see actual uh, cellular details of the trees, just like it was a modern piece of wood. So we can use sort of modern tree cat catalogues to identify the wood that's 100 million years old. It's quite amazing. And you can see that there are very good tree rings in here, which is one of the things I studied. Very strong, which is not surprising, in the very seasonal climate. So summer light all, all day long in the, in the summer, 24 hours, and then, and then the winter night would have come on during several months here of winter darkness when the sun didn't come above the horizon. And probably these trees went dormant at that time. And then you can see they're quite regular. There's nothing unusual. And in, in the hundreds of fossil logs that I've looked at, there's nothing unusual about them. They are, there, there's no real insect attack. There's no sense of frost. These trees loved growing in Antarctica. They grew really well, and they were very happy there. Until they died, and then they floated out as driftwood, and then they were buried, uh, bored by uh, these, these boring shells, these boring gastropods that that bore into driftwood and uh, made big holes in them. So when they fell to the sea floor, all these big holes fell, uh, filled with mud, which is what this is here. But the trees were very, very happy in Antarctica. Then we find, um, and that one I showed you was actually a conifer. Then this one, you can see we find these imprints of uh, ferns, so we find these leaves in Antarctica. And they're extremely similar to the ferny leaves that you see in places like New Zealand, Tasmania today, uh, living tree ferns. So these are ferns which have, if you've seen them, they have very tall stems made up of all the, the sort of leaves and trunk, and then these, this sort of umbrella, this umbrella of ferns at the top. And you've probably got one in your garden, and it's probably dead because they're very trendy to have in garden centres in the UK. Um, and they don't like the UK climate, so they will die. They, <laughs> so they're very expensive, so my advice is don't buy them, <laughs> unless you wrap them up very carefully in the winter. But the reason they're here is because these tree ferns are very common in the forests, of, particularly in Tasmania. And when um, they, they log the forests in Tasmania for pulp to make newspaper, and they just clear fell all the forest. Well, they cut down all the trees, which is terrible, and they therefore collect a lot of these tree fern stems and they export them to the UK so that they can die in your garden. But uh, it's very, very sad. But we have them in Antarctica, just like this. Then there's a, um, a big nodule here, and you can see there's a stem in it, there's a branch, and you can see all the leaves attached still to the branch, which is really unusual because, you know, most leaves fall off a tree, fall off the branch. And that's because this is a waxy leaf of a monkey puzzle tree. So here's a lot of monkey puzzles. They are growing here in the volcanic district of Chile. So if you go to the Andes and you go to the volcanic district in Chile, you can go up high. And there are the most amazing national parks up there. And some of them are just this wonderful national parks full of monkey puzzle trees with Southern Beach, Nether Fagus below. And they just look like you know, a dinosaur should walk through there. Just superb. And they're particularly tolerant of these uh, cold climate conditions in the high volcanic peaks. If you want to go on a really great walking holiday in Chile, just go up to the volcanic region. There's lots of these active volcanoes with fantastic vegetation around. And you've probably got one of those in your garden as well. And they were generally brought back to the UK by Victorian botanists who explored South America, and they brought back some of the cones off monkey puzzles. And many of the, many of the exotic South American plants you find in, in gardens these days are all sort of um, clones of some early Victorian ones. So this is a reconstruction of some of the forests in Antarctica. So this was painted um, by Rob Nichols, uh, after the work of a PhD student, Jodie Howe, who worked on uh, an island called Alexandra Island in Antarctica. So what Jodie did was she mapped the location of all the different fossils and the trees. And this is a, really the best and most accurate reconstruction I think you'll ever find 
of a fossil forest of 100 million years old in Antarctica. So here's, here's the sort of Andean peaks up here in the background with active volcanoes. Here we've got large tree with a monk, uh, maidenhair tree, um, ginkgo, biloba type trees, very common in the past. Here's the ginkgo tree. Here's a southern hemisphere conifer. Here's a monkey puzzle tree. Here's a tree fern. There's some normal ferns down here. There's um, some uh, plants here which we know went extinct in the middle of the Cretaceous. There's a few ferns, there's a few um, liverworts, a few mosses, but what there's not in this painting are any flowers or any kind of flowering plant. A hundred million years ago, there were very few uh, flowering plants on Earth and, and none in these forests. So this was really the time of the ferns and the conifers and the, and the cycads, which, are, which you see in here. And we find these as fossils in Antarctica. So when Jody mapped them, so this was the actual position of the spacing of all these trees. So when Robert brought this uh, painting back, we discussed about how this painting would look like. And we said, well, it's really lush. There must be some animals in there. But we've never found the bones of any animals. So I asked him to draw a couple of small eyes in the undergrowth, just to show, just to show that somewhere in there, there must have been an animal living in here. It's so lush. And I was really disappointed when he brought this back. And, he, and I said, Robert, you haven't put any eyes in there. Where, you haven't put my animal. And he said, yes, I have. There's an animal in that picture. Can you see it? He's hidden it. It's extremely well camouflaged. There it is. Down there, look. So this is that dinosaur in that marine picture of the ocean that was floating out to sea. So here he is, living on land. This is a dinosaur. We found the dinosaur sort of further up, further north, up in the Antarctic Peninsula. And they've been found quite commonly in Australia, which was joined to Antarctica. So this kind of dinosaur probably wandered across Gondwana about 100 million years ago. It's a, it was about um, nine metres long, probably. It's quite small, a herbivorous dinosaur, vegetarian dinosaur eating just foliage. And, um, you know, was quite actually common around the world of that time. But, but certainly something that lived in Antarctica and lived in other bits of, of Gondwana. So there he is. And the challenge for any of you young, young scientists here in the future is to go back to this island, Alexander Island, and find the bones of that dinosaur. So what we find then, um, flowering plants come in a bit later. 100 million years ago, there were the conifers mostly, no flowering plants. But about, by about 80 million years ago, so still in dinosaur time, there were flowering plants in Antarctica. So here, here's that leaf of Nothophagus, and this is what it looks like at Southern Beach in, uh, in Tasmania. This is a leaf uh, which we recognize as modern Proteaceae. Here's some in Chile. So Proteaceae are those very big waxy plants that you can buy. I saw them in Waitrose at the weekend. So and they're in Marks and Spencers. They're these big waxy things that are very tough. They all come from the Southern Hemisphere. And we had relatives of them in, in um, Antarctica. And then we get these tropical leaves here. You can see a kite-shaped leaf, which comes from Queensland. And you can see the kite-shaped leaf from Antarctica. So by now, you should realize that what we were looking at in, in um, Antarctica was the ancestral vegetation of all the vegetation that lives today in the Southern Hemisphere. So if you go to Southern South America, to Patagonia, if you go to um, um, Australia, Tasmania, if you go to New Zealand, you are really looking at the sort of the, um, the relatives of some of these forests that once grew in Antarctica. And in fact, if you go to um, either New Zealand, but particularly in the west, western side of Tasmania, there is a fantastic big state, state park with all this old native vegetation in it. And, and it's just like Antarctica would have been 100 million years ago or a bit, a bit younger because there are some flowering plants in there. And all you need is a dinosaur and you'll be back in Antarctica. So a fantastic place to go. So here we are, here it is, let's go into some of it. So because it lives in, some of this stuff lives in Tasmania now, so it's temperate forests that we're looking at. We're looking at something like a mean annual temperature of 10 degrees and much warmer than now, obviously, in Antarctica. 
So here's a, this is a high in the mountains of Tasmania. We've got Southern Beach, this kind of scrawny looking tree. But here's the leaves of modern Southern Beach, which is very similar to those that I've shown you fossil. And it has a very distinctive fossil pollen, which is um, uh, like modern pollen. So you can see here's the, it's, it's, it's got these nicks out of the edge. So we can tell in all our beds of rock when we find this pollen that this tree was around at that time. And here's Proteaceae. So I had a postdoc working on this, and she was a palynologist. So you can see this very distinctive fossil pollen from our sediments in Antarctica. And that shows you that we had the Proteaceae. You may recognize these now. Something like those flowers were living in Antarctica at that time. They like warm climates, 10 degrees or more uh, temperature. Then we have tree ferns here. Um, and here's the very simple pollen grain there. We can we can um, work out what the temperature was like, not just from uh, comparison with modern leaves, but we can also look at the fossil leaves. And there are botanists who've worked on the relationship today between characters of flowering plant leaves and climate. So you, what we, we, and we apply the same kind of relationship. So we look at the margin of the leaf, whether it's got teeth on or whether it's smooth. We look at the size, the shape, the venation, and different characters of the leaf. And from there, we can work out the temperature, summer temperature, winter temperature, and the average temperature and rainfall in the past. And so we've got specific temperatures that relate to some of these times in the past when we had these forests in Antarctica. Now, we also had fire, in, and not surprisingly, since we've got um, uh, f far forests that lived on the flanks of volcanoes, so, you know, volcanic erup eruption or lightning would most likely set off a fire. And we can tell that because we have bits of charcoal. And one specifically really great uh, deposit of charcoal it has all these seeds and plants in them. So you can see here a picture of a, a scanning electron microscope picture of a fossil seed, which has got all this beautiful sculpturing. What, once you've burned a piece of plant, it doesn't do much. It doesn't rot, it doesn't uh, uh, decay, nothing attacks it. It just is a bit fragile and, and crumbles. But there are some beautiful bits. And I'll just show you one thing. I had a person working with me who could identify flowers, and she identified the oldest flowers from Antarctica. So these are 80 million years old, again, the time of the dinosaurs. And we had flowers in Antarctica like this. So this is the fossil. It's about a millimeter long. And you can see that it's sort of a small cup like this, and it's got a little hat on it. So it's a vase with a, a top on it. And Helena recognized that this is very similar to the reproductive bits of a, um, euca like a eucalyptus, the family Myrtaceae like a eucalyptus or a gum, like a gum nut. So here you can see the cup at the base, and you can see the little hat, and then all the flower comes out in Australia. And there's lots of different types. So here again, here's a little cup and the cap on the top. So we had something that was sort of related to the family that eucalyptus is in today, living in Antarctica about 80 million years ago, the first flowers in Antarctica. So here's another reconstruction. Again, so now you've got the idea that Antarctica was green in the past. Uh, this is now 70 million years ago, so it's a bit younger. It's still the time of the dinosaurs. The dinosaurs became extinct at about 66 million years ago. And so there are dinosaurs in here. So this is a different artist, James Mackay in Leeds. Here are the mountains again with some birds. There's some shapes up here of trees that look like monkey puzzle up in the highlands. These trees here are very ancient, sort of big, gnarly southern beach, Nathophagus. We've got uh, tree ferns. You can see the red flowers here of Proteaceae. We have uh, pollen that shows that Gunnera was here. So if you go to a botanical garden, you see these great big leaves, bigger than me, that, that uh, live alongside streams. We had those. We have mosses, ferns. We had other different flowers. So quite a lush vegetation at the last sort of few million years of dinosaurs. Then my Argentine and um, American colleagues work on fossil bones that we find, along with the plants. And you can see here sauropods. You can see uh, hadrosaurs, the things which made a big uh, 
hooting sound with the big trumpet no nose-like things. There's velociraptors in here, feathered dinosaurs, uh, ducks. So we had ducks with dinosaurs, and uh, a lot, you know, quite a lot of life in the forests in Antarctica. So there was really a busy place, plenty of flowers that would have smelt nice, probably, and uh, very green and luxurious. And then at the end of the Cretaceous, all the marine reptiles and the dinosaurs went extinct, just like the rest of the world. So gradually they, they, they disappeared. So the dinosaurs disappeared. Um, the feathered dinosaurs, of course, stayed around, so they weren't affected. Um, the the uh, big mosasaurs and the ammonites in the oceans, everything in the oceans was affected, but the plants just carried on. So there was very little change in the vegetation composition at the time when the dinosaurs died out. So they, that just carried on. And we found the same kind of leaves and pollen after the Cretaceous, after the death of the dinosaurs. They just carry on in um, Antarctica. And, and it carries on. So now we're at 50 million years. And this is another reconstruction by another artist working with a group from, of American uh, scientists from the American Museum of Natural History in New York. And so this is, a, this is the same island, Seymour Island, without the dinosaurs. Dinosaurs have gone. And so the mammals have a uh, rule of the land. You can see the same plants. So here's southern beech. Here's the winteracea kind of plant that we found. Uh, here's the monkey puzzle tree. And, and, you know, the same kind of vegetation. Instead, we have possums, marsupials in Antarctica, found us bones and teeth. We have these things called, um, they're called Gondwana theers, which I think is a bit like a, well, it's, it's kind of like a primitive llama or something like that. Uh, there's a big ratite bird, so these great big birds that were sort of carnivorous and really quite fierce, I suspect, and um, really quite a lovely area. The other thing you can see is down on the beach, there's some black spits, and these are penguins. And we find penguin bones alongside um, um, some of the plants. So penguins evolved in Antarctica when there was no ice. They like living in Antarctica when there was uh, warm climates. And there's all different kinds of species. They're found in the same horizons that we find, all the leaves in there. There's no evidence for ice. So Antarctic, uh, penguins evolved in Antarctica when it was warm. And most of the sensible ones went to live in, you know, South America, uh, South, uh, South, South Africa, Galapagos, uh, Australia, and the stupid ones stayed behind and lived in Antarctica, even though it got exceptionally cold. But really, they evolved in the warmth. Now, what happened after that? About 40 million years ago, we have evidence for ice on Antarctica. And we know from the record and from climate models that probably the cooling was caused by a gradual decline in CO2. So when all those volcanoes were going off in Antarctica and there were forests in Antarctica, we can estimate, geologists can estimate carbon dioxide levels, and we estimate that there is over about 1,000 parts per million of CO2 or, or a bit higher. But CO2 level dropped probably naturally from just natural uh, cycles, decreasing CO2 over millions of years. And, and something quite sort of special happened to Antarctica tectonically that really sort of caused the death of the warmth in Antarctica. So you can see Antarctica here and circulating around Antarctica now, there is this cold, 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 cold current called the Circumantarctic Current. Now, when Antarctica was joined to South America, you couldn't really have that current. The, the current flowed from the equator and brought warm water down all the way to the coast of Antarctica, cooled, warmed up Antarctica, and then went back to the equator. As soon as, tectonically, these plates moved apart and a big gap appeared, a deep channel appeared, the Drake Passage, the roughest waters in the world, this is seasickness territory around here, believe me, then that current could run around Antarctica and it never got warm and it sealed Antarctica in its kind of icy tomb. And that happened about 20 million years ago, around roughly then. And then that's when the ice sheets on Antarctica really began to grow. 
And most people felt that that was the time when there were no more plants in Antarctica. Until some time ago, a few years ago, some colleagues of mine were working up on these rocks here. So this is, this is look way, way in the Transantarctic Mountains, 300 miles from the South Pole, which is down here. This is the Beardmore Glacier, the famous glacier that uh, Scott went to the South Pole with his party down here and then came back and went down there and, and the parish down here. They were on that side of the glacier because this side over here where we were is hugely uh, um, crevassed. It's a real nightmare trying to, trying to get onto the glacier. Luckily, we had a helicopter, which Scott didn't have. So we hopped over to here by helicopter. And when we were over here, what, what we found, which had been discovered a, a few years earlier, were there are lots of fossil leaves in here. And you'll see, you recognize this now. This is Southern Beach, North of Vegas. And there is a sequence of rocks. So this is where that picture was taken from along here, this sort of cliff line about 200 metres high. Of, and these rocks are about are roughly about 10 million years old. So they're much, much younger than anything we've been talking about. They're the time when Antarctica was covered in ice, and there were ice glaciers coming across here. And this is the kind of rock that was deposited underneath the glacier. So glaciers were coming from the South Pole. They were grinding all the rock in their, in their pathway, and then they dumped all of this sediment here, this, this rock, rock debris, really, in this big pile here. And it's been eroded away. You can see it's eroded away by the present glacier. This is to remind me that it was extremely cold there. It was about minus 25 on a warm day. Um, but it was really, really quite fierce cold here but beautiful and sunny, and the air is so clear that if you can get out of the wind, then it was really warm. And luckily, the wind always blew from the South Pole this way, so it was a real pleasure <coughs> to work down here. And this is what we found. So here I'm very happy because we found bits of fossil wood. So this is 10 million years old. This is tiny little bits of wood. They're about the width of your little finger. They're about a centimetre in diameter. And I chopped them open and had a look, and there are about 100 tree rings in there. So that little piece of wood is ancient. It's really 100. It grew to the grand old age of about 100 years. And so it was growing very, very slowly in probably pretty rough conditions with glaciers around. And here it is again. So here's another piece, very small, very contorted. It's hugging the ground, hugging this horrible glacial soil, uh, probably inundated with glacial meltwater and gravel every now and then. Here's, here's one that kind of uh, grows in the Arctic today, which shows you, not this is not beach, this is willow, but it shows you the kind of shape that... Um, vegetation takes on tundra ground. It's so frozen, there's no nutrients. And these little twigs here are hundreds of years old, flattening themselves on the ground to avoid the horrible cold winds of, of the Antarctic. So we've got really got a real tundra vegetation at that time. These little bits of wood I've sectioned, thin sectioned hundreds of them, and they're all southern beach. And lo and behold, we also find sheets of southern beech leaves, here you can see, there's a beautiful one there, in layers, brought down, uh, carried by these glacial melts. So at times the glaciers retreated a little bit, melted a little bit, and the melt, melt water carried uh, uh, some of the leaves and twigs that were growing and sort of adjacent to the glaciers into this area and then buried them. And here they are, the autumn leaves of southern beech from Tasmania again for comparison. And then in these forests, we also have, you see this lump here? This is about the size of a very large potato, the size of a watermelon, actually. And it's light. If I gave it to you, it would be like a, a bag of peat. And this is just plant material, 10 million years old. And this particular plant here is like this bright green stuff here, cushion plants, again, which you find in the high mountains. This is the high mountains of Tasmania, Mount Reed, where you see these small dwarf shrubs and then you see these cushion plants growing amongst them. So this is probably what Antarctica looked like 10 million years ago. Glaciers are about to come over this again and, and uh, really destroy them. So these are the last forests in Antarctica. And then that was the end of vegetation on Antarctica for, for millions of years. And so the vegetation got swamped. 
And then about five million years ago, the Earth really went in what I call a deep freeze, and it got really cold both in Antarctica and the Arctic. So the first ice appeared in the northern hemisphere in the Arctic roughly around about five million years ago, much later than the Antarctic. And at that point, then the ice really did extend, and it extended right across the continent, really covered all the land of Antarctica, and really covered it in the ice that you see now. And, and really, where, where we are now, so even, but sort of some time ago, in the maximum state of the, of the ice ages, the ice it was far more extensive than it is now. It would have completely covered this area. This is a Antarctic Peninsula, an island called Adelaide Island. And then I'll just put this in to show you one of our research stations here. So the British Antarctic Survey has five research stations in Antarctica. And you can see a station here on a piece of rock. There you might be able to see that there's a sort of a long, thin thing here, which is a runway. But it is in spectacular scenery. And um, I took this as I was going in. I go and visit rather uh, most years in January to take visitors there. In, in this spectacular summer weather. And here's Rothera. You can see it's really like a small town. So here we have a, uh, an airport for our five planes. We have a, a, a harbor for, I uh, currently have two ships, and soon we'll have one ship, the Sir David Attenborough, that's being built now. And we have biological laboratories, places to do atmospheric science, space weather, and a whole range of sort of uh, logistics for working in this kind of climate. Um, we have uh, several main topics of research that are going on today, lo all looking at how the climate, the changing climate, is impacting Antarctica and the polar regions. And I know from, from the past, as a geologist, we know that when there is a change in the Earth's climate, it's the polar regions that are affected the most and the first. They're most sensitive because they're the streams of the Earth. The equator is a lot more stable, so it's the polar regions that really change first. And that's what we're seeing here. We're seeing most dramatic change in our current climate warming. So these biologists are having a look to see what um, the impact of warming waters is having on the, on, the, on the animals below. So even though it's in Antarctica, if you've been watching Blue Planet, you will know that Antarctic waters are really full of life. They've got the most amazing life of, of, uh, of anemones and uh, starfish, brittle stars, and all sorts of strange things living there. What the biologists have been finding is that these creatures are very well adapted to living in very cold temperatures. And um, if you warm them up in experiments, even one or two degrees, they really don't like it. They, they die, basically. So they have a very small tolerance of very cold temperatures, extremely specialized, really can withstand all sorts of things. We have fish that don't have red blood cells in them. They have antifreeze in their blood. And, um, and they, they just live. They don't move very much, I can tell you. We have some in our aquarium. They just sort of sit there. They eat very rarely. And some of the, the, the sponges and the, the anemones are hundreds of years old. They grow incredibly slowly, but extremely tolerant of the cold temperatures. But what a lot of people of many nations are working on in Antarctica is the changes to the ice, the ice and the ice shelf. So this is an ice shelf. You can see what happens is the glaciers bring down ice from the land. And then when it gets to the edge of the land, it then floats out over the sea. So the shelf is a really flat area. If we melt the shelf, nothing much is going to happen. But when it cracks up, it is a bit of a problem. And if you've seen in the news and if you've seen Horizon programs, we have a station in Antarctica called Halley on stilts and skis, which we've had to move because it's actually this ice shelf. So Halley is about over there somewhere has big cracks in it which have developed, and uh, we've had to move the station across, across the other side of the crack to be safe. But it, it keeps cracking. So watch this space. Now, the issue that uh, most people are working on are about these ice shelves. This is an amazing picture from NASA, which uh, shows you, because it's colored, the, the big ice streams. So these are the glaciers on land where the ice is draining from Antarctica from the continent into these ice shelves. So the purple areas 
are the ice shelves where the ice has reached the sea and is floating out like a plate on the, on the uh, sea. And these ice shelves, there's massive ones here. This is about the size of France. The Ronnie Filchner and the Ross Ice Shelf, and you can see lots of small ones around the edges. They act as kind of doorsteps or buttresses to keep the ice back on the land. What will happen if any of these break up is that that buttress will go and then suddenly all this ice from the continent will stream down into the ocean and then that will cause sea level to rise globally as all that extra water flows into the ocean. So in particular, we're looking at this area here, which is called the West Antarctic Ice Sheet, because there's two ice sheets. This big one here is sitting on rock. This one over here, which is pointing towards South America, is really only pinned to a couple of areas. And you can see there's quite a lot of uh, ice shelves around here which are susceptible. So here's another satellite map. And this shows you, uh, the red colors show you where the, gla the, the, the glaciers are, are thinning most, where, where they're kind of melting. And you can see here, this is the area here on the West Antarctic Ice Shelf, which is this bit here. This bit here has about five meters of sea level rise in it. And it's pinned to about three areas of rock here. And most of this in the center is actually, if you like, on, at sea level or below. So it's in water, it's not really uh, on rock. So it's very susceptible to, to melting. And what's happening at the moment is that the warm water from the oceans are coming up underneath these ice shelves, underneath and melting them from below. And so uh, what we're looking for really is to see once they start, start melting these ice shelves, then they can get inside of these ice shelves. And, and of course, if this West Antarctic ice shelf is hollowed out, once, it, once the warm water gets inside there, it will melt the heart of, out of the West Antarctic ice shelf. So we're waiting to see. So there's lots of people trying to look in the past. Has this happened in the past between, between glacial phases when the Earth has warmed? And what's going to happen in the future? How long is it going to take to melt? How will it melt? You know, what, what, does, it, what does it take to really melt this, this, these ice shelves down here? So we don't know yet. So this is the big, big projects that we're working on. We have a big project that's about to start on a glacier here called Thwaites with American teams because it's just so, such a big place to work. So these ice shelves are really important. Here's one here, the Thwaites. So we'll be working on this ice shelf. Uh, there'll be lots of activity there in future, just trying to see whether this ice shelf here is really stable or is this warm water getting up underneath. Here's the glaciologists. They're going to spend a lot of time on the top uh, looking at the glaciers to make, see if they're melting due to warming. As people on ships will be working at the front to see how warm the water is and where it's going. We'll be sending robotic gliders, auto subs, underneath the ice shelf to see what's happening underneath the ice shelf. So this will be a long project. It will take five or more years to work up, but we should be able to understand what's happening to these big ice shelves. So... In a, in a sort of conclusion, we can see here, we've gone from, I've shown you about 50, 100 million years ago, Antarctica was covered in green forests. And it really was a fantastic place to be, especially if you're a dinosaur. Um, and then about 10 million years ago, 12 million years ago, it got very cold, but there were still tundra environments like this in Antarctica. And then five million years, and today we're looking at ice. And the big question is how fast and are we going backwards this way? And how fast are we going to go back? So just to finish off, I'm just going to show you a small video which advertises the British Antarctic Survey, but it also gives you a feel what it's like to work in Antarctica today. No, not that one. Let's, let's get this video going. No, go away.
Thank you very much. Well, Jane, thank you. That was quite magical. And uh, what a wonderful blend of uh, beauty and science uh, and something that's really important for the future. Um, I think you're kind of going to take some questions. So usual rules apply. If you try and catch my eye, if I like the look of you, I'll call you. Sir. I think you said about 100 million years ago, the water temperature at the Antarctic, it would have been about 15. So what would the equator be? Oh, well, the interesting thing is that from, certainly from a lot of fossil evidence, what, we, what you can see is that the equator is much more stable than the polar regions. You know, I said the polar regions respond more centrally. So all the fossil data that we have for the polar regions suggests that it doesn't change very much. So although the, uh, the polar regions were much warmer then, the equator was warm, but it wasn't hugely different from what it is today. So the, the, the equator to pole temperature gradient was much, much less, which actually probably gives you much more sluggish oceans, you know, the, but still carrying heat to Antarctica. But certainly the, the polar regions, there's, there's actually quite a little fossil evidence for the polar regions, but that which we do have suggests that, that you know, the average temperature of the polar regions is 28, 30 kind of thing, that that's the temperature in the past. Yep, gentlemen there, yep. Thank you very much. The, uh, you, you intrigued me by saying that 65 million years ago when the dinosaurs died out, the plants carried on. That, um, I would have thought that would have meant the plant-eating dinosaurs <laughs> carried on, but perhaps they were the only food for what uh, <laughs> meat-eating dinosaurs were left. But it was quite, I was quite surprised that the plants actually managed to survive through that same period. Yes, we really don't see much, we don't see much difference in the types of plants. It may, be that, it may be that for a few years there may have been some impact on the, on the, on, on the vegetation on Earth. I mean, it's really hard to get down to the annual level. And I mean, just recently, and uh, you know, I think it was last week, I was reading some more work that, that the um, Americans were saying because of the sulfur content in some of the rocks, they think that there were freezing conditions even near the equator for a few years. I certainly don't see any evidence of that in Antarctica. And you think that would be where it got coldest, you know, at that time. But it may be that it was a very short time period. There is a classic, what, what people classically refer to as a fern spike at, the, at this boundary. So the implication, if you read books about the, 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 you know, the catastrophe at the end of the Cretaceous, you may read about that everything was devastated and that ferns came back like the first colonizers. We, we don't really see this in Antarctica at all. It may be there, it's just we haven't sampled the right horizon. It may be a very small horizon. But certainly in terms of the the sort of composition of the vegetation. There is no major change in the composition of the vegetation before and after in our section. Two rows back. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask a question about today. Um, the plateau of Antarctica is at about 2,500, 3,000 feet, I think. 3,000 meters, I think. And whether the, that is decreasing or increasing would depend upon the precipitation, which will be mostly a snow, I should imagine. Do you know whether the precipitation rate is increasing or decreasing in, in Antarctica? Uh, At the moment, the interesting thing is there is more snow on the high plateau and that's because it's counterintuitive, but that's because the warming air is carrying more moisture into the interior of Antarctica. So there is actually more snow currently. I mean, it, most of the snow in Antarctica blows around. So, but, you know, while there is this warming phase, yes, there is an increase in snow in, in the centre of Antarctica. But I don't think it's going to pile up enough that it's going to, um, you know, counteract the melting at the, at the edges of Antarctica. David. Would you give any prediction as to where in 10 years or 20 years 
the West Antarctic ice shelf will be? I think in that short time span, we won't see that much difference. I mean, uh, we're, we're talking on quite long-term scales. And in fact, our, our new project, the Thwaites Glacier Project, which starts next year, will probably still be going in 10 years' time. So I hope it's still there. Otherwise, <laughs> we've got some people to rescue off the ice shelf. But I think, I hope that by, in 10 years' time, we also certainly will understand <laughs> what is actually happening to the ice shelves. I mean, you have seen in the, I'm sure you've seen in the news recently about Larsen B ice shelf, the big one, um, uh, you know, the B, big, big iceberg. But it's hard to tell, actually, whether that, is, um, that big iceberg has cracked off due to climate warming or just natural uh, movement of the ice shelf. I mean, you've all c constantly got a flow of ice coming off the land into the ocean. And at some point, it's going to get really too heavy at the end, you know, to keep floating. And so that, that is the natural carving effect of, of ice sheets. So what we're watching out for Larsen, the Larsen ice shelf, is to see whether there are more cracks and, and you know, rapid, rapid iceberg formation, rapid carving, and then that will be quite different from normal. And the last time the other Larsen, Larsen B ice shelf broke up, it was because there were a lot of melt pools that formed on the surface as well. And so that's what we're looking for now, to see if there are changes in the whole ice shelf to see if that's going to go. Lady at the front here. Um, seeing as you're doing so much research on, on quite sort of where the melting will happen, whether it's sort of from below or above, this is probably going to sound silly, but does that have any, um, is there any intervention that can be, take, apart from globally obviously reducing warming, is there any application of, you know, working out exactly how the melting will occur in terms of possible... You mean, can we stop it? No. Kind of, yeah. No. It's too big a system. It's too big a system. Um, we're talking about the whole ocean here warming and then affecting your shelf. So, no, I don't believe that there is any ge geoengineering that we can do. We, what we need to do is stop putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which is, you know, causing the blanket that's causing the warming. Mm -hmm. But certainly on individual places like that, no. It's, we're talking about a massive, massive, massive area exactly. and, and a kind of system of ice that would be impossible mm -hmm. to stop. Mm -hmm. no. Nature mm -hmm. will have its way. Scary. Gentleman at the back. Um, I'm afraid my... Knowledge of cosmology is perhaps a little limited, but assuming that the inclination of the Earth's axis was much the same then as it is now, there would still have been a very long winter night continuously. I can believe that plants hibernated, but how on earth did the dinosaurs manage? Very good question. So in the, in the 80s, when people were beginning to work on this, they, they, uh, you'll see some papers from the 80s in which people said that to allow plants and, and animals to live in, in these high latitude regions, there must have been some major impact on the earth and the axis of the earth changed or went, became more upright so that there were more equal se seasons. But that, of course, has been now completely debunked. But, but yes, the plants clearly survived uh, the, the, the long winter nights. Um, and, but the dinosaurs probably just moved away, you know, because we've got land connections with Antarctica. They could probably migrate into higher latitudes where they were able to, uh, you know, have, have a normal winter, probably still cooler temperatures. I've done some experiments with colleagues in Australia on some of the plants, on modern relatives of some of the plants that we found. And we just, you know, the best way, the best temperatures that plants can, can um, survive in, in in that kind of conditions when it got dark, is cool and dark um, during the winter. Not warm and dark, because they just use up all their <coughs> food supplies. So cool and dark, and not go too deep into frost either, otherwise they would die. So if we had winter, uh, and you know, so we're looking at the rim of Antarctica probably, so that would be three months or, or less of winter darkness. The plants clearly could become dormant over that time. They weren't affected at all. There's nothing in the plant fossils to suggest that there was any specific adaption. They just probably went dormant. Uh, but I think the animals, the big dinosaurs, just moved away and just went into lower latitudes and um, just you know, worked out the winter and then came back in the, in the summer when it would be very nice indeed. <laughs> Long walk, yeah, possibly. Gentleman in the middle here, please. Uh, 
Has anybody looked at any of these sponges and, and abundant plant life for um, medicinal drugs, um, antibiotics, things like that? Um, Bioprospecting is really interesting. It's, you know, Antarctica is governed by an Antarctic treaty. So all the nations, 53 nations work in Antarctica. Nobody owns it, and there is a treaty which uh, limits certain activities, warfare, and you know, it's the continent for science and peace. And when we have our treaty meetings, bioprospecting comes up quite a lot to see whether or not, how we would deal with it if, you know, drug companies did find medicinal, uh, medicinal um, animals or something in, in there. So there are people who are taking Antarctic uh, soil fungi and things like that back to their countries and cultivating them to see if there are potential for drugs or anything, as you might expect. Uh, so far, there, is, there are no sense that they, that they have. We do have people working in Basso down the road who are looking at um, some of the animals that live in these extreme temperatures and what they're finding is that um, they have a their particular adaptation to the adaptation to the cold is really beneficial, and they have particular enzymes in them that are, are really help them to be cold tolerant. And they also have a certain way that they fold their proteins in there. So there is interest from uh, from say companies that make ice cream, that make low temperature washing powder, um, and that also make false limbs you know, by some of the ways that these animals have adapted to, to the cold temperatures. So um, if, you, if you'd like to know more, come to Basson. I'm sure some of the biologists will talk to you about it. And they would also like some sponsoring too, so <laughs> to take this to the next step. But there definitely is something about these animals that are living in these cold temperatures that might have potential in the future. Gentleman there. Thank you very much. Um, assuming that global warming con continues as anticipated and the glaciers thin further over Antarctica. Presumably that would cause a rebound on the tectonic plates there. Would that amplify the sea level rise or counteract it? Well, that would be quite regional. So what will Antar if, if all the ice goes on Antarctica, then we've got a very, very high sea level rise. So hopefully that we've learned how to keep CO2 levels down before that happens. But um, yeah, most continents, there's a lot of heavy ice on Antarctica. And if the ice sheets go, then there will be some rebounding of the continent. But um, that will not necessarily affect global sea levels. It will affect the continent itself. We've just, uh, just be, um, talking about that, we have uh, maps in, uh, in Bass where some of our cartographers have taken the ice off Antarctica so you can see that actually what's below Antarctica at the moment is quite a lot of islands and um, uh, big chunks of rock, but you know, it's a bit messy with islands and seaways, but of course that will rebound. And they've just done one of Greenland, which is really interesting because the Greenland ice cap is going fast. And if you took the ice off Greenland, you'd just get this kind of circle, like a saucer of mountains, and a big <coughs> bowl in the middle. And that will be very interesting to see when that goes, whether the central part of Greenland will be uplifted or it will always stay a kind of bowl-shaped ring of mountains in the future. Full of minerals, actually. <laughs> yeah. Gentleman at the back there, please. Uh, with reference to the melting of the, uh, the ice sheets, uh, you talked about uh, the warming from the sea undermining. And you also mentioned that the ice sheet is actually only anchored to the seabed in two or three places. And, and also that it's holding back the carving uh, due to the movement of the glaciers down to the sea. Is there, the, is there not a danger and any evidence that the uh, undersea melting is going to, if you like, break away those anchor points. And at which point would there not then be massive breakup of the ice sheet and increased carving from the uh, glaciers as the flow rate increases? Absolutely, you're totally right. And I didn't mention that because I gave a talk last week and said that, and everybody went, oh, my God. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but, um, yeah, modelers, modelers have shown so that one of the sort of predicted um, uh, effects in, in the longer term, I mean, we are talking hundreds of years, probably thousands of years, is ultimately if the... Uh, and this is why we're doing the research on it in this Swaits project. If the warm water gets up underneath this ice shelf 
and, it, and then it can get over a lip and it gets into the heart of the West Antarctic ice shelf. It will melt, melt the ice shelf from below. And there's a lot of climate modeling that's been, uh, an ice modeling that's been going on recently. And it does show that it's like, you know, it's like melting a, a ice in a puddle. It takes quite a long time to melt and then suddenly it will go quite fast. And so the models do kind of imply that once we've got to the heart of that ice, ice sheet, it will melt quite quickly. In, well, we don't know the timescales, maybe hundreds of years as opposed to tens of thousands of years, but we got to get to that stage first. And yeah. one of the things that colleagues have been doing is, is looking at ice cores and looking at the rock record and looking at all different kinds of you know, geological records ice records to try and understand when, it, when the climate became warm before, not, not at the time I was talking about, but in the warming interglacials of the last ice ages, whether or not that ice, the West Antarctic ice sheet did actually disappear or not. Gentlemen. Thank you. I thought it was interesting that you explained how the tectonic plate drift allowed the circumpolar um, current to seal off Antarctica. Is there any evidence of any temperature change within that? Uh, current or close to that current now? Now, oh yeah, so even on a ship, when you go, when you sail on a ship and you go from southern Chile uh, or Falkland Islands down across to Antarctica, you can almost see the front, you can almost see the change in the, in the Sioux Seas and the current. So yeah, there's a distinct cooling and you can feel it when you, when you actually cross over it. So there is, the, 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 the edge of it is slightly eddied, but there is a very distinct change in the, in the water, in the composition and in the water. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't know about that. I don't. I'm not, I'm not sure. And gentleman down the front here, please. Would you like to say something about the effects of volcanic activity under the ice, which was something I knew nothing about but read about quite recently, and what role that might have played and how it might have varied in the past? Yeah, there are quite a lot of volcanoes in Antarctica, believe it or not. And um, um, certainly the chain of that ch the Andean chain, you know, through the Antarctic Peninsula, but also all the way through uh, down um, on the other side of Antarctica, where you, you may have seen pictures of Mount Erebus. I mean, Mount Erebus is an active volcano, and there are um, active volcanoes on the tip, or dormant but warming volcanoes on the tip of the peninsula. So there are there, and of course, then you, if you go, <laughs> in my map of Antarctica, if you go off of the tip of Antarctica and you go off towards um, South Georgia, and there's some islands there which are active volcanoes, and you may have seen in the news about, um, what's it called, uh, Zavadovsky Island, which is an active submarine volcano that's coming up from the sea floor um, that, that's on a tectonic plate. So, you know, you've got actual volcanoes building. So there is quite an interesting uh, study of um, the impact of having a volcano underneath an ice sheet. I mean, obviously, it, it comes up and there's uh, eruptions and it does melt the ice and create all sorts of different ice structures. But it causes um, sort of more local, local impacts rather than sort of global ones. Please. Was there any identifiable evolutionary event or process that moved everything from greenery to flowering plants? Ah, oh, big question. So, yeah, this is a really good question. I was just, uh, just reminding myself, actually, today that Darwin called this the abominable mystery, the origin of the angiosperms. So a paleobotanist, one of the things they are searching for continuously is the first flowering plant. And when, when did it evolve? So uh, I, nobody, nobody has written a definitive paper yet on when the first angus, but when the first flowering plant evolved. And there's lots of different ideas about where the flowers evolved from, different, different trends of plant, different species, lineages of plant that may have um, uh, developed into flowering, flowering structures. Um, there are some ideas that they may have uh, developed in water, be, uh, adapted from water plants and then developed and then gradually developed into trees on land. Uh, there are pictures you can see in books that the first, the first oldest flowers are sort of very simple five-petal uh, 
kind of flowers on, on shrubby bits. There are also reconstructions of small weedy water plants that have tiny flowers on. So this is a big mystery that still has yet to be, uh, to be answered. But there certainly wasn't sort of one specific event that led to the advent of flowering plants. Otherwise, we would probably have identified it by now. So that's still another thing to find out. And probably it's a very gradual evolutionary change that's going to be very hard to pin down. We're getting close to the end, so I'm kind of probably going to allow myself the last question. Um, Jane, you said there's nothing we can do to geoengineer our way out of trouble and that it's all about controlling the carbon dioxide. How well can we model the impact of different levels of carbon dioxide on what happens in Antarctica? Oh, well, well, the models are getting better and better. I mean, the models are models, you know, and they have their flaws. Mm. And understanding the whole Earth system, which you would have to do if, to make models. We've got one of our models, models over here, so you can answer that question, yeah. can't you? <laughs> <laughs> OK, I'll let you off this one. <laughs> but I'm uh, trying to understand the whole Earth system to try and model it, of course, is a challenge for the modelers. They're getting better and better and better to try and understand what's going to happen. Um, there are models, uh, as you, the, the best way to see where the models are, are in the, in the report of the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change. I mean, scientists get together every few years. They put together all their, all, all their results in this big report, the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change, which is you know, what politicians and uh, 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 governments look at you know, in Kyoto and currently this week in Bonn uh, to assess uh, how, how well developed the models are and how important the results are. So, yes, people have been trying to model the impacts of different levels of CO2. Uh, yeah, you know, it's a, it's a major activity of climate modelers. But getting those models right is really important. And, and the really important thing is, from, from my point of view, is to get the models right, you have to understand whole cycles, whole cycles of environmental change. And we can't do that now because we're now and we can't do it into the future because we have no data. So we have to do it in the past so we can see models of climate change. So, you know, the message is that people always say, oh, it's so depressing about climate change. But, you know, what we need to do really is we need to, to do everything that we're being suggested to keep the levels of carbon dioxide as uh, low as we can or as stable as we can um, there's some geoengineering like burying carbon dioxide back into the rocks, which is, which is feasible because oil companies do it already. Um, and we need to sort of look at that a bit more, I think. Putting things into the atmosphere are just going to cause more mayhem. But um, even if we stop CO2 rising today, there's still about a lag of 100 years or so while the temperature will rise to equilibrate. And we just need to be able to adapt to it. We just need to understand what's going to happen and make sure that we adapt to it. And to be able to understand what's going to happen means being able to look at all the scientific evidence that we've got, put it together, and listen to the scientists to say, this is probably what happened, you know, move the cities away from the shoreline, you know, low-lying areas where people are living in the South Pacific, inevitably are probably going to be covered with water. There are going to be more storms. Let's not just bury a head in the sand, but adapt to it for a while. Thank you so much. <laughs>